Welcome to the Atmosphere Church channel. On behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for watching. We pray that this message will touch your heart and change your life. Regardless of what you believe, where you come from, or what questions you might have, you are welcome here. Our desire is to help lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more information about us, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. And don't forget to click below to subscribe. Enjoy the message. Serve Day at Atmosphere is a time where we get to go and throw out all this generosity to the community. Everything we do is completely free, no strings attached, Jesus style love. Live the love. That's why we wear it on our shirts. That's our anthem as a church. That's our battle cry is live the love, uh, the love that Jesus showed us. We want to go out and show that to people. It's been super, super cool so far. There's been some God stories already. I was talking to a guy earlier. His name's Oscar. He's with his mom and his sister. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill your gas tank up today. He's like, I've never filled my gas tank up. Uh, next thing you know, we fill his gas tank up. We're talking to him. He starts tearing up, like tears coming down this guy's face because we're filling this gas tank up and we're talking about the love of Jesus. We have probably 20 other stories for the rest of the team that are just like that, and that's pretty cool. This is amazing. The Holy Spirit is really moving today. We can just see it. Some of the things that happen today, people, when we approach them, they're standoffers, they're like, whoa, what are you doing, you know, why? And they'll turn away, no, I don't want to receive that. And a lot of us are so conditioned to not receive love and we're, we want to do everything we can for God on behalf of God to change that and show people that God loves you and God's here for you and just let them know. In a world that's changing so much right now and is so crazy, hope is key and I think people need to know that and so that's just what we're trying to show today. The Holy Spirit is amazing. I feel like you can feel the love and just being able to like loving people because they're asking like why are you here and they're like what free and we're like yeah we just want to show um god's love and mercy on you and just to see wow like you guys are wanting to do this for the community that's what our church is about it's about community and helping others around us serving other people and doing it all for god the people that are getting their gas bottle are obviously getting served but us as a team are probably getting fed even more just because of the opportunities that we have to see their reactions, see them come to the Lord. I see it on my face too, just the opportunity that we have to talk to people. I feel like every time I see one of these people on the team going up to fill someone's gas, I'm in tears. I found myself so many times walking up to vehicles as soon as someone would come out to get some fresh air while we're drying their car. And I would just look them in the eyes and I would be like, thank you so much for allowing us to bless you. We are the body of Christ, like moving through the world. And it's just beautiful to be able to be a part of that and let God move through me. I, mean, I love helping you. I mean, it's, it's my passion. And he worked through my heart and my hands today. It wasn't about me. So it was, it was just a great day, a good experience. And uh, I look forward to doing it again. breakfast of champions right here. What's up everybody? How's 930 doing? All right. Can we give it up for our online family tuned in right now? We love you guys. My name is Pastor Jim. I am the lead pastor here and it is so great to have you guys this morning. You guys are coming into the final talk in our series simply called Holas. Look at your neighbor and say Holas. It is so, so good. Jesus said it so good. It is the best. It is the greatest of all time commandment to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. And we're going to get into this last talk that we're, we're calling All My Strength. And it just so happens that we have serve day this Saturday. I didn't plan it like that. That's just when I know God is involved in all of these talks that we prepare and we pray for, that we are talking about serving God the Sunday before our serve day on Saturday. And so if you've never done our one of our serve days, it is so powerful. I, I like to say it this way, the church is at its best when it's outside the building, okay? 
And I'm not just talking about all of you watching in the overflow outside, all right? So uh, before I get into today's talk, our final talk, I, I do have a couple housekeeping things. Uh, some of you already got the memo that our new property space that's two doors down caught fire on Monday night. And uh, the, the good news is they were doing a roof repair uh, that went astray and uh, the roofers called 911 and the Ventura County Fire Department were here in like a minute. Can we give it up for our firefighters? In a minute. They had that thing, they were in, the fire was contained, and so we haven't lost any momentum as far as the progress. We're, we're still making progress. I, I know we're not in the building yet, but it is still inching closer and closer. And it just tells me there's spiritual warfare involved in moving into this new space, which will double the size of the auditorium space, and it'll allow us to, to serve you better and make room for more. Because some of you are like, I want to invite my family, I want to invite my friends, but I want a seat. <laughs> so, so we're working on that. Uh, we're actually playing around with the idea of a Thursday night gathering uh, just to do, it would be exactly like Sunday, but on Thursday night for those of you that maybe that is more convenient. And again, it's so that we can make room for more. So the good news is the fire was contained and now I'm telling people the roof, the roof, the roof was on fire. That's what happened, all right? So just check this out. When we f did the demo, we broke a water pipe and thousands of gallons came out of water all over the floor. We cleaned it all up, it was beautiful. And, and then there was a fire that descended upon the building. So our building has been baptized by water and with fire. So God is, <laughs> God is, God is preparing the room for us. So uh, if you have your Bibles, go with me to Mark chapter 12 is the text that we have been studying over the last several weeks. Today is week five of the series, and we are closing it out. And the other housekeeping item that I want to mention is uh, last week uh, I was thrown off my groove because uh, this service, the, the leadership decided they want to pray over Pastor Andy and I uh, for Pastor Appreciation Month. And I appreciate being appreciated. But I, can I tell you something? You know, my wife, I want to appreciate my wife because without my wife, so, so even though technically she's not a pastor, can we give it up for Tara, my amazing wife? who just does so many things behind the scenes. I just want to honor her uh, by, by just saying that. But I was thrown off my groove, and we didn't pray over the conflict in Israel. And so if, if any of you left going, he didn't even talk about what's going on. It is my apology. I, I want to talk about it. Matter of fact, I felt like the Holy Spirit this week has been showing me clearly that there is so much misinformation out there now that we need to talk about this because it, it really talks about Middle East conflict in our Bibles. And there's some of you that are totally, uh, you know, unfamiliar with all of the prophetic uh, mentions of the nation Israel and all that goes with it. So we're going to spend some time next week looking at this specifically. But as we open the word together, I want to not just pray for our time together. I want to pray for the time of all these people caught in the conflict in Israel, in Gaza. So can we lift them up in prayer as we begin our Bible study today? Father, we thank you so much. And I extend my hands towards Jerusalem and towards Israel. And Psalm 122 proclaims to us, Lord, that we are to pray for the peace of Israel. And God, as a church family, we pray for the peace, God, of the Middle East. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would descend upon that land. And God, first and foremost, protect all the babies involved, Lord, on both sides of the border. Lord, we pray, God, that you protect your kids, Father, supernaturally. Lord, we pray, God, for those hostages and those people that are caught up in this, Lord, that they would be delivered safely to their families. Lord, we pray for Holy Spirit revelation to all of the leadership involved, even to the United States leadership, as we start looking at how we're going to get involved, Father. I believe this all plays in 
to this great story, God, that you've already declared the ending to in our Bibles. And so, Father, we pray for heaven to intervene in all of the stuff that is going down in the Middle East. And Lord, we pray, God, for this Bible study that we're about ready to do. Lord, I pray, give us the ears to hear and the hearts to receive everything you want to speak into our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Okay, so I'm going with, uh, going somewhere with the cereal, okay? All right, I didn't just bring out my breakfast to show you guys what I ate this morning. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But before we do, let's go over the scripture that we've been diving into, okay? So it is found in Mark chapter 12, verse 30 says, and I love how the New Living Translation reads it. It says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your what, church? All your strength. Now, remember, we've talked about these four boxes, and we spent some time looking at what does it really actually mean to love God with your all, with your holos, with each one of these boxes. We've already talked about the heart. We've talked about the soul. We've talked about the mind. Now we're going to talk about the strength. Now, loving God with all your strength is not going to the gym and doing a couple extra reps of the bench press or throwing on maybe some more weight going, hey, I'm loving God with all my strength, all right? I am powerful in Christ as I do these extra reps of bench press. Let, let me take you to the actual Greek meaning of the word strength. It means, uh, it's the word iskus, and it means ability, force, strength, or might. I like to say it this way, loving God with all your abilities, loving God with all your abilities. Now in the Hebrew, remember this came from the Shema prayer that we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and uh, Leviticus chapter 19, or talks about this idea of loving God with your all. And in the Hebrew language, this word for strength means to be exceedingly richly, lavishly, with all your might, with reckless abandon. I, I like to say it this way, putting everything on the line, putting it all on the line. That's the idea of strength when it comes to this Hebrew meaning. And, and probably the best like kind of story in scripture that really demonstrates what it looks like to put it all on the line and to love someone with all their strength is found in the book of 2 Samuel. And you can follow along on our app through our app notes. But look at 2 Samuel chapter 23. So David is going to become the king of Israel. He's going to rule and reign. And while he is in the process of being, you know, promoted into the seat. He's getting all of these men that believe in his leadership and they're following him. The Bible mentions them as the mighty men of David. And these guys were a motley crew. They were these thugs, but they, they loved David and they, they would do anything for David. And these Philistines, which were the enemy of Israel, they had it in for any Israelite, and they were just the known enemy. And listen to what these mighty men of David did for David. It says, David longed for water. And he said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, which was right in the Philistine camp. He says, so the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David, but he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord and he said, far be it from me, Lord, to do this. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives and David would not drink it? And such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. I mean, they put it all on the line to fill David's hydro flask. I mean, they went and just said, we're, I mean, he wants it, we're going to get it. They love David with all their strength. So here's the question for the day. What is the most radical thing that you have done to express your love physically with your body, with, with your life for God? Because this is what it is, putting it all on the line. Now, as you think about this idea of strength and what it looks like, let me just mention this understanding here. You, you've got four boxes, the first three boxes we've covered. 
the heart, the soul, and the mind. Think about what those boxes are. They're everything that, that represents the inside of us. Everything on the inside of us. The strength is what is represented on the outside of us. And I do believe that the proper order is to have strength last. Because if you don't have the inside right, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to get your outside right. So some of you that struggle in your faith of making the right decisions and, and doing the right things to, to live the godly life that you want to live, it starts on the inside of you. See, religion preaches to us uh, that, that it's all about your behavior. And you just got to do the right things, obey the right rules, and, and you'll, you'll live out the life that God's called you to live. But a relationship has to do with everything on the inside. And it's interesting that Jesus put the order in heart, soul, mind, and strength. And strength being last. Because here's what I know. If your inside, if, if what's on the inside is correct, it's going to be a lot easier to love God with all of your strength. And this kind of has something to do with my props today. Because how many of you have ever been super hungry or like in a rush and you, you go to the pantry, you grab the box of cereal, you're like, oh, I got just a few minutes. And then it's, there, it's, there, it's in the pantry. You grab it and you're like, all right, man, I'm going to pour me a, a quick bowl of cereal and then I'm going to be on my way. And then you pour it out and you're like, oh, who did that? Who left barely any in there? Because they, they were just afraid to take it all, or they were, they were just lazy, they didn't want to throw it out. And you're like, oh, okay. And then you go to the fridge, and you grab the milk, and you're like, all right, man, well, at least I could put, a, you know, some milk on it. And then you're like, what? 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 Who is the joker that left not even a, a little bit of milk to feed an infant? I believe there's a special place in heaven for those of you in this room and those of you watching online that put empty boxes or boxes that have scarce any product in it back in the pantry or the fridge. How many, how many amens do I get out there? Come on, somebody. So why do I do that? Because I think this is how a, a lot of us are approaching our relationship with God. We, we want to live godly, but there's just barely any substance on the inside of us. And then when it's called out, when we, we need to pour out some godliness in our life, there's barely anything in there. So if you, honestly, step one, if you really want to love God with all of your strength and put it all on the line for God, then it really begins by loving God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. But let's look at this for a second, because this idea of loving God with your strength is about applying it to the outside. It's, it's lifestyle. It's the things that you're doing for God, the ways that you're being active for God. I love 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. I, I, I really think it really personifies this idea of loving God with your strength. It says, my children... Our love should not be just with words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. Look at your neighbor and say, action speaks louder than words. Just tell them that. Action speak louder than words. So, so loving God with your strength is a love that says, God, I love you so much, I'm going to do something about it. Are you tracking with me? I'm going to do something because of my love for you. There's, there's an action involved. And the way we get stuff done is through our bodies, with our hands, with our feet, right? With our mouths. Like we're active. We're doing things for God. And so I want to just give you three ways that you're going to be able to love God with all of your strength. You, you can write these down. And again, they're on our notes. But if you really look at these three things as something you can do that is going to allow you to activate your love for God to your strength, then this is it. Number one, write this down, is through serving. Through serving. Now, serving is something that is the most organic and natural thing that comes in loving God. And a big part of that is because Jesus modeled this for us more than any other characteristic, I believe. 
He showed compassion, but he showed compassion. He demonstrated compassion by serving. And most of the time it was serving people that most of the Jewish people around him would look at and deem as unservable, if that's a word. I just made it up. That, that th These are people that aren't worth it. They're people that, that God doesn't love anymore because they've done some horrible things. And those were the very people that Jesus was activated and he began serving. If you really want to see the heart posture of Jesus when it comes to this attitude of servanthood, you look at John chapter 13. And he took the lowest form of a servant when he was having this dinner party and he started washing the feet of all of his disciples and he said if you're going to be a part of my kingdom you, you need to take this attitude you, you need to position yourself lower than anybody else and that humility that lifts other people up is the definition of what a servant is and you are called not only as a child of God you're also called as a servant of God and Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, understood this principle very well because he addressed almost every letter by beginning it by saying, Paul, a bond servant of God. That means I'm not in forced labor. I'm in a labor that I've chosen in my own free will to give myself over to. That's what a bond servant was. That's how Paul saw himself because that's the radical lifestyle that he saw Jesus model and to adopt and to activate in his church. Now there's two groups of people that we're supposed to serve. There's the people on the outside, people around us. I, I call those, you know, those people the world. And then there's the people on the inside, the, the people that are with us, which is you and I. This is the church. This is we are family, right? That's us. All my brothers, sisters, and me. That's, that's who we are. So, so there's a servanthood that there is supposed to go to everybody that's around us. And then everybody that's also with us. So it's a twofold servanthood. And so let's talk first about the people around us. These are the people you work with. These are the people that you live by. These are the people that maybe you shop at the grocery store with. Just maybe you don't know their first name, but they're around you. And, and I want to just declare over somebody, you're not at your job by accident. You're there on divine providence. Now, I, I believe for some of you, maybe not all of you, but I believe some of you, you know, I don't know why I'm here. I believe God put you there on purpose. And maybe it's just for one person that you're working with that God's saying, I, I want you to serve them. I, I want you to do something to help them. Here's what we believe as a church family. We are to find a need and fill it, and find a hurt and heal it. Find a need and fill it, find a hurt and heal it. And here's what I know about the people around us. Most of them have a need. And maybe some of you know some of the needs of the people you work with, the people you live by, but you're, you're saying, hey, I'm going to do something about that need. I have the resources. I have the capacity. I have the capabilities to actually fill that need. And when you fill somebody else's need, you, my friend, are being a servant to that person. You're serving them. And then you find a hurt and heal it. You know what's so crazy? I moved here from ministering to the inner city of Las Vegas to one of the most affluent areas in the United States. I just read this probably a couple months ago that this area, the LA area, is the fourth most expensive place to live on the planet, in the world. This is expensiveville. That's what I call it now. And, and the reason I point that out, because I came here with a preconceived idea that money would stamp out a lot of people's hurt because they wouldn't be struggling with this thing that I saw so many people struggling with in Vegas. But I discovered something to my surprise. There's actually more hurting people here than there were where I was doing ministry in Vegas. And the truth is, money cannot heal a hurt. And there's some hurting people that you're living next to. There's some hurting people that you're working with. The saying is, everyone is going through something you know nothing about, so be kind always. When somebody cuts me off on the freeway, I used to be like, I'm going to run down. But now I'm just like, Lord, bless them. Because 
Man, maybe they just got a fight with their wife. Maybe, maybe something's going on, and Lord, they need you. They obviously need you because they left their angel back there because they're driving crazy, all right? They need you, Lord. And, and so I pray prayers of blessing. Church, listen to me. If, if we can be activated to, to see every human that we run into as not a, a mere coincidence, but as a divine providence act of God, that he's putting us in their path because he wants us to make a difference in their life, we would be seeing and hearing about more miracles. That's why the serve day, when we do it twice a year, we have more God stories for our church in these two days that we set aside on the calendar every year than we do for the entire year. Because we are purposely, intentionally saying, we're going to take four hours of a Saturday and we're going to show some just outrageous generosity and radical hospitality with no strings attached, Jesus-style love to unsuspecting humans that live near us in our community. Some of you have never done something like this. This message has been teed up by God himself to say, I want you to see what it looks like to serve people in your community, whether it's washing cars with us, cleaning up somebody's yard. Uh, Carol, who is our dear neighbor, she was the one that told me about a project in our own neighborhood. She goes, this is a single mom. She hasn't been able to clean her yard. And so we have a whole crew ready to go, Carol. It's so cool. They're going to go clean our neighbor's yard, and it's going to look totally different. And the neighborhood will appreciate it. But more than that, this single mom's going to appreciate it who hasn't been able to do it. And we as a church are going to come alongside of her and help her. That by definition is what a servant is. So if you're not doing anything, come and join us, all right? That's not too late. You'll get an amazing epic shirt. Come on, love like Jesus. I mean, that's cool. And uh, we're going to shirt you up and we're going to love our community really well. I was going to say love the hell out of them, but that just, uh, that probably... <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll do that too I don't know I don't know I don't know but then there's the people with us this is the church so we're not just supposed to love the people that we're shopping at Target with and, and pump free gas in their car by the way it, you know you guys have seen the gas prices we are filling people's tanks up and I'm not telling you where we're going so you can't text your friends alright we're going to be like we're going to be all over the place but you know, if, if all of you just gave an extra $10 above and beyond what you normally give, we're, we're going to be able to radically love our community. Um, but it's going to take probably an extra $13,000. Some of you gave last week, and we say thank you for that. But if some of you could give a little extra above and beyond, you will help us love our community and serve our community super well this Saturday. But let's talk about loving one another. I, I love... 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. See, when I hear loving God with your strength, I hear loving God with your strengths. How many have ever done like a, a Myers-Briggs survey or, or a strengths finder? Uh, how many have heard of the Enneagram where you're like, this is who, you know, I'm a, I'm a three with a wing eight and the weird stuff like that. You're like, that's, that's like weird terminology. Well, do you know the Bible has a way to help us discover the strengths that God has supernaturally given us? It's called spiritual gifts. And we just did a series not too long ago when we went through the book of 1 Corinthians and, and we called it Messy Grace. And Paul spends a few chapters in this book talking about the significance of the spiritual gifts that God has given you. So when you got saved, God gave you some strengths that you didn't have prior to being saved. So it's like he, he went into his cupboard and gave you a, a scoop. And you have a little, everyone loves, but you have a little extra scoop of love. Everyone serves, but you have a little extra scoop of service. Every, everyone should be able to articulate the gospel, but you have a little extra scoop of teaching. And so in this great variety of gifts... God has equipped you so that we can serve together and help one another and become this powerful entity, organism, that is making a difference in this world. The church was Jesus' idea. 
This isn't a man-made institution. This was a God-given vision that God had given to his son to say, I'm going to activate them and together they are going to change the world. So how many of you have ever visited a family and you went over there and they have littles and then without even being asked like you're you know fellowshipping you're having dinner and then the kids just like get up and they start clearing the table they're in the you know doing the dishes wiping the counters down somebody takes the trash out and you're like watching this and you're like wow my kids need to come here and live because they're teaching something that I desperately need because when, when everybody is active when everybody is participating it makes for a functional family. If all of the responsibilities on one person or just the parents and the kids aren't contributing, you know, it, it creates dysfunctionalism. It, it creates this thing where, where it's top heavy towards certain person and one person is overwhelmed while the other people are just watching Netflix and, you know, having to be told five times that you got to take the trash out and they're not taking the trash out. So to be a functional family of God, we got to stop this attitude where 20% of the people do 100% of the work. Like when we come together, when everyone feels a call of God that you have been gifted by God, you're going to step up to the plate and by you participating, you're now a contributor. And here's what I know about the American church. Most Americans are used to being served. We go to a restaurant, we're served. We go to, you know, watch a game, we're served. We're served so much that it almost is a built-in expectation that people are here to serve me. And unfortunately, we kind of carry that into the church sometimes. And we're conditioned to be consumers in the world. So we take that consumer mindset into the church. And the church has not done any favors because we've built these lavish auditoriums that look like a theater that make it feel like you, you are at a show. And so everyone's like, just give my popcorn and give me this to drink and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch a show. So we're like consuming Jesus like he's a snack. When in reality, Jesus resurrected to activate you, not so that you can sit and be a consumer, so that you can stand and be a contributor. Hello, somebody. Look at somebody next to you say, you're a contributor. And God has gifted you to be that person. I like this quote, everyone is gifted, but some people never open their package. Have you opened your package? Have you, have you really seen what, what is it that God's gifted me for? There's all kinds of assessments, just like you can take strengths finders and, and personality assessments and find your Enneagram number. You can do all that. But there is also assessments about your spiritual gifts. Some of you didn't know this. So you can Google it and you can do your own or you could scan our QR code and you can text the word gifts with an S on the end and you could print this out this week, maybe for your life groups you can go ahead and, and bring your completed spiritual gifts assessment to your life group and share what maybe you scored high on. But this isn't the, the way to fully discover what your spiritual gifts are. The only way that you can really fully understand how God has equipped you to be a servant for the family is by actually experimenting with that which you think you're called to do. Because there's really two defining ways to have your spiritual gift, uh, you know, told to you and for you to verify what your spiritual gifts are is number one, when you're actually doing something, it's going to fuel you. In other words, you're going to serve some capacity and you're just going to be done, like say after four hours of like serving, maybe it's like helping with the kids or, or maybe it's like doing something outside or doing something with tech. And you're just like, wow, that was so good. And man, I feel so energized. I feel ready, you know, to tackle, you know, everything in the world. And that's life-giving. That's like fueling you. And some of you, you go back there with the kids and you're just like, oh man, like, you know, there's nothing that is more like heaven than a three-year-old and just speaking to it like, oh, that's heaven. And some of you are like, are you kidding me? Like being trapped in a room with 30 babies, that's not heaven, that's hell. That's like, that's terrible. That's not life-giving, that's life-taking. And that's just evidence that you're not gifted to do kids ministry. But others of you are like, man, that is my power zone. I love it. The second way is it feeds others. 
And when you start serving in a capacity, you know that you're discovering your gift when other people start giving you positive feedback. They're like, what you did, that really, that really spoke to me. That really impacted me. That really inspired me. That really encouraged me. You get things being told to you like that, and you're like, aha, I've discovered, I believe what I've been gifted for. And then when you're serving, it is going to take your, not love for God to the next level. It it is going to take your experience with God to the next level because the God stories happen for people that are actively serving him. You can't expect miracles to happen if you're actually not stepping in into this role of being a servant for other people. And then what I love is that when, when you step into these arenas of being a servant, whether it's serving people that are around you or serving people that are with you, the cool thing is God has this built-in reward system. He rewards you. And it's actually a scientifically known thing. And now scientists and sociologists call it the helper's high. And the helper's high is, is when you serve other people, you, you have a chemical reaction going off in your body and your body is being given a dose of dopamine. The same kind of product that happens when you take like narcotics. Like everyone's like looking for a high. Man, so God has built into your body a chemical to release when you help other people so that, hey, you don't need any more oxycodone. You, you got... You got the ability to serve somebody. You don't have to turn to the narcotics because God's built in a narcotic so that you can be so addicted to serving people you won't want to stop. Check out what he says. Proverbs 11 verse 25, he says, those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. This is God's boomerang principle. You go and encourage somebody, it boomerangs right back to you. Some of you right now are struggling with depression. You could barely get out of bed this week. And I don't want to oversimplify depression. It's a very complicated subject. So don't take me out of context. But some of you, you are depressed because you are inactive in your faith. If some of you were to just step out of yourself and out of what you feel is depression and go and radically serve someone, maybe even this Saturday, come to the serve day, I, I really feel like some of you are going to experience a breakthrough in your depression. Maybe it's not going to cancel it out. Maybe it's not going to get rid of it. But it's definitely going to help you climb out of the pit that you feel like you've fallen into. I don't know who that's for. But I'm telling you, it's a real phenomenon. Serving, write this down, serving keeps you from swerving. Tweet that. (laughs) Serving keeps you from swerving. It really, honestly... You're, the more you're doing this, the more you're like, man, I can't, I can't stop this. And, and the more you're tracking with God, and the less you're going to get off track in your faith. Serving keeps you from swerving. Second point, write this down, and that's through sharing. So you got the first principle is through serving. By the way, can you put up that slide for the A team? Uh, this is something... Some of you, you, maybe this is the first church you've ever been a part of. You're like, I'm not qualified to serve. (laughs) Join the club. God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people that are striving to be more godly and to love him with all of their strength, which qualifies all of us. So everyone here can do something. So maybe you start by scanning that QR code or texting the word team and just exploring, like, where, where can I start? How can I start serving in the church? Because if we go from 20% of the church helping to 100% of the church helping, everybody in this entire state will know about Atmosphere Church. Because they're going to say, that is a functional family. Everybody is activated. And that's my prayer as your pastor for you, that you, you stop sitting on the sideline. We get you out of the bleachers. Put the popcorn down. Let's go tackle somebody in Jesus' name. All right, come on. So number two is through sharing, through sharing. So obviously, you know, sharing your faith is for some people the most intimidating part of their faith. They're like, hey, I, I'm good with God, but man, I don't know. Like, I can't share my faith. I'm kind of embarrassed. I, I just feel I don't know a lot about the Bible. But do you know there is a mandate on your life since you are a follower of Jesus to let other people know that 
Jesus is real and wants to change their life. Let me give you scripture. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Then Jesus said to them, so wherever you go in the world, tell everyone the good news. What's the good news? That God loves them, that he sent Jesus to die for them, and that Jesus resurrected so that heaven might be filling their lives and they can live a different kind of way. That's the good news. That even though you're a sinner, even though you've blown it, even though you've made mistakes, Christ still died for you and forgave you so that he can empower you to live differently, to live more heavenly in your life. And I know there's so many methodologies out there about like how you share your faith, but I want to really simplify it for you. Because some of you, how many would brand yourself as an overthinker? Raise your hand. And some of you aren't raising your hand because you're overthinking raising your hand. Gotcha. You're just like, oh, I don't know, should I? I don't know. You know, here's, here's the simple way to share your faith. Obviously, Jesus did something in your life. So you start there. Tell your story. What was your life like before Jesus? How was your life radically changed with Jesus? And now what is happening in your life because you are following Jesus? Those, those three, like look at your life as like three chapters. Before Jesus, introduced to Jesus, following Jesus. So maybe what you could do this week is go home and just think about your story and then start maybe telling a friend. Start with a friend. Get comfortable with telling your story to a friend. And then next time it pops up, you are ready. You're like... You know, because you might not be able to know every Bible verse. I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring for a long time. So he's like, hey, Pastor Jim, what's that verse? I go, I don't know. I like, I haven't memorized this entire book. Like, it's, it's just a lot of verses in here. But there's gotquestions.org. And you could, you know, if there's a complicated question, your friend. So don't let the enemy disqualify you because you feel like you're, you're not ready. Because nobody's ever going to feel ready. But loving God with all of your strength means you're laying it all on the line. Exceedingly, richly, lavishly, I'm going to do something that is uncomfortable because I want to love God with all my strength. And what we have to do is we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'll never forget one of the most uncomfortable moments is when I started feeling a Holy Spirit prompting to go minister and share my faith with another dude that was on the elliptical at the gym. And he, I mean, you guys see those guys at the gym that are just like covered head to toe with sweat. Like, I don't know, he's been there, I think for five hours, like doing, and, and I'm like, I got to go talk to him. I was compelled. I would try to work out a little bit and the Holy Spirit was like, go talk to him. I'm like, oh man, look, he's, he's covered in sweat. He's just like in a zone. And the Holy Spirit's like, go talk to him. So I went over there. I jumped on the machine next to him and I started going, hey bro, hey man, I'm working out over there, but man, you know, I'm a Christian and man, I just felt compelled to come over here. Man, he loves you. He, he died for you. And God sent me here for you today, bro. I can't get it out of my mind. Like he sent me here. I don't know what's going on with your life, but he sees you and he loved you. And he, he just kept running. He's like, man, you, you have no idea what this means to me. He goes, thank you so much. And I can't say like, I'm like, hey, let's pray. Because he was in, like, I didn't want to like mess with his workout. If, if he wanted to, he would have stopped. All that to say that even me as a pastor, like I'm not off the hook, even though I'm speaking to you, like I have to share my faith when the Holy Spirit puts opportunity in front of me to share my faith. And the more you do it, not only are you loving God with all your strength, but that's where the miracles happen. The miracles happen when you activate yourself and do something with your faith. Here's number three, write this down, and that's through sacrificing, through sacrificing. You know, loving God with all of your strength isn't necessarily what you do. Loving God with all your strength also has something to do with what you don't do. Boundaries that you put around your life, you're saying, I want to be obedient to God and to God's way. And how many of you know, sometimes God's ways interrupt our ways, our desires, our propensities, our impulses. A lot of times we're, we're trying to go the opposite way, but yet when you read scripture, you're like, oh, I, can't, I can't do that because man, that, that's pulling me away from where God wants to lead me. 
And so there are, are some moments that you're going to face as a follower of Jesus to where you get to love God with all of your strength by showing restraint. Said, I'm not going there anymore. And this is my ability to lift up a banner to say, I fully belong to God. And even though I have the right to go that way, I'm not going to go that way because I want to be a living sacrifice for what God has done for my life. Check it out. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, what God has done for you, to offer your bodies as a what? As a living sacrifice, holy, that means set apart and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. (laughs) What's so difficult about this is we're Americans. I have my rights. I don't know why I talk like that. I have my rights. Can't take my rights away. I got the right to do whatever I want to do. And so you have this attitude of like, okay. Okay, you're right. You have the right. But listen to what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. He says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial for you. Can you think of some stuff that you've given yourself over to because you have a right? You're not going to jail for that. But afterwards, you're like, I don't. I feel just this friction between me and God. Not because a pastor told me I can't do it. Just there's, some, there's an internal conviction that I'm feeling that's saying this is the wrong way. Folks, when you heed that little voice inside of you saying, hey, this is not right. When you put it on the altar of God, you're sacrificing your rights for you to live the right way that God wants you to live. You're you're putting it on the altar. Can I ask a question? What in your life right now that you have a desire, an impulse, or you have your right, like that God is just, I can give you a laundry list of things that scripture talks into, but right now you don't need, the Holy Spirit's already telling you it's that thing. It's that thing. Yep, that's it. That, That right there. It's in your head right now. Are you willing to take that and put it on the altar Because a sacrifice is something that dies. That you let die so that Christ can live more fully in you. What needs to die? And what scripture is saying that a way that we can love God with all of our strength is saying, God, this thing that I have a right to, I'm letting die. I'm giving it to you. Jesus said it this way in John 14. He says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves the will, uh, the, the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. You will see God move more fully in your life when you more fully give yourself over to him by giving up those things that he's telling you to stop doing. And to keep means to simply to guard. Then putting up some guardrails and say, I'm not going, I'm, I have the right to. Nobody, nobody's like taking me to jail, for, but, but this isn't the right way. So I'm going to sacrifice that so that I can live more fully for God. This is where the idea of self-control comes in. And you have been given the Holy Spirit to help you on this principle right here to love God with your strength. That you're not doing this on your own willpower now. You're doing this on God's power because the Spirit lives in you. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Certainly, you can say no to something that your desires are wanting to say yes to. Are you tracking with me? It's healthy to say no to yourself. Because there are some things in this world that if you give yourself over to, it will mess you up and even potentially kill you. So as we think about this, as we close We're going to love God with all of our strength through our serving, through our sharing, through our sacrificing. And as we wrap up this series, I I just want to speak to you because remember that the key to unlocking the door to the promises of God for your life is found not in the sum. Loving God with some of your heart, some of your soul, some of your mind, some of your strength. It's found in loving God 
with your all. Loving God with your all. Have you really stepped into your relationship with God with the whole loss, with all of it? Because my friend, when you do, I mean, you're going to have God just dosing out of your body, of your life, of everything you do, because he's moving so strongly in you. This is what we're talking about. Not just some faith that we share on Sunday. It's an active faith that's changing us Monday through Saturday too. And that's what Jesus is inviting us into, saying this is the greatest commandment of all time. Why? Because this is the one that makes a difference not only for you, but it makes a difference for everybody in this world. And my prayer for you and my prayer for our church is that we begin to live in the all of God so we can start experiencing the awe of God. Father, in this moment, take our lives. We want to be living sacrifices for you, for your kingdom. I feel right now that some of you in this place, is God's been calling you to serve. He's Maybe you, you used to serve, maybe 20 years ago, you were like a leader in another church and you're just like, man, I got burned, I got hurt. I don't want to serve anymore. But yet you're the very one I'm talking about that's been feeling depressed. There's nothing worse than knowing that you've been called by God to do something to make a difference for somebody else and not do it. There's others of you, you're so intimidated to share your faith. And as I sp I'm speaking about this, God has been putting somebody on your mind. Saying, I want you this week to call him. I want you to speak to him, a coworker, maybe somebody that lives even in your own house. Just say, man, I, I gotta share. Don't overthink it. Sometimes sharing your faith, it's just say, hey, would you come to church with me next week? I have these amazing Kalu students come last service and they invited their buddy. Never been to church in all of his life. And he told me, he said, Pastor Jim, I'm coming back next week. Don't overcomplicate sharing your faith. It could be an invitation to join you next week when you come back. And some of you, man, God is speaking loud and clearly about the sacrifice. Something that needs to die. You have a right, but it's not good for you. You have a right, but it's not beneficial for you. And God is saying, if you want to love me with all your strength, put that at the altar. Let that thing die so that I might live more fully in you. Lord, speak to us. And some of you have never received the invitation to follow Jesus in your life. It's real simple. He died for you. He knows that you're messed up. He knows that you've made mistakes. He died for you anyway, so that he could forgive you. You could be cleansed of every wrong that you've ever done against God so that you could be eternally forgiven and be given a place in heaven. But he also resurrected, he's off the cross so that he could be in your life. He died to get you into heaven, but he resurrected to get heaven into you. There's a new way he wants to empower you to live, a life full of love a life full of peace, a life full of life. And you've never said yes, and today's your moment. I wanna just pray for you. If that's you, say, Pastor, I feel so far from God, but I sense this invitation today to follow Jesus, to give my life to him. If that's you right now, I, I want you to just pray this prayer after me. This is where your journey with Jesus begins. Just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Thank you for dying for my sins. I believe that you died, but you also resurrected so that your spirit could come and live in me. And Holy Spirit, come and live in me. For today I give you my life. And I'm following you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, one of the easiest ways to connect with me about this because I want to help you take that next step in your faith is text the word follow you online you could do the same thing text the word follow to 805-334-8700 
and we'll be in touch with you. Uh, I'll be outside after the gathering. I'd love to meet you in person. Even if you're newer to our church, I'd love to say hello to you, know a little bit more about your story. Maybe you could share your faith with me, the pastor. I'd love that. And uh, we love to close our time uh, with worship. So if you're able to, let's stand together and let's worship God. Thank you for tuning in today to another great message from Atmosphere Church. If this message is spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes, podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you should see it right below this video. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not only these things, but also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray that you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.